Okay, and we're back, hour number three, and we're going to talk to Michael Collins this hour about some new research he's been doing, which shows that over here, we are experiencing an impact from the radioactivity being released at Fukushima Daiichi, primarily. Now, the latest stories that are going up tonight show that at least 50 years, more than 50 years, will be required to begin to contain the radioactive release from Fukushima Daiichi. These are two new stories I'm getting ready to put up in another hour or two. There's a lot going on, and Michael Collins is here to tell us about his research and what he has found. Hello, Michael. Welcome back. How are you? Uh, good. Considering. Yeah, a little more radioactive than I was last week, I guess. You know? Right. That, that when you hear something like, it's going to take 50 years for us to do it, that is pretty obvious code for we're not doing anything. Or that all that stuff you see us doing, like building those uh, flimsy but kind of, you know, impressive structures around the destroyed oh, don't reactors they look nice. of Fukushima Daiichi. Nice and clean, and yeah, right. Nice and clean, you can't see all that wreckage, but you notice that there's a lot of uh, 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 venting on the top, that even though we do that, and even though we pulled just two uh, fuel assemblies out of the spent fuel pond in uh, Reactor 4, and what are there, over 1,300 assemblies like that. in that pool? Yeah. And if that thing crashes, as we've talked about many times, all bets are off. When you hear that it's going to take 50 years, and yet they're actually doing something, that says to me that they don't know exactly where the corium is, where the melted core is. They don't know what's melted down, melted through, melted gone. They don't don't have any idea in most cases. That's right. And so what we're left with is uh, a public that is, you know, slowly thinking, you know, well, I guess it's okay. Well, what we're seeing and what our new research has found and is actually coming out tomorrow, the big hot orange is the name of it, LA air radiation doubles. Uh, we've discovered not only uh, different threads that we've pulled together to try to give people in the Golden State here in California and the rest of the country and Canada an idea of what's going on and how the... the uh, uh, the danger to the population and to the environment in general keeps increasing. Uh, we've been able to look at several concepts of radiological uh, contamination and its transport and come up with some things that are backed up by studies that were very hard to find that put together, paint a situation where even in places like Southern California or the desert regions of uh, Western United States that have relatively low rainfall, uh, our ch- our exposure to airborne uh, fallout from Fukushima is still uh, uh, a big concern. The piece we have coming out, Jeff, just to just to give you the major the major uh, uh, points that we go through, and it's a long one, and I know it's been long promised, but this this does take a lot of time. Of course, we're talking about how in the recent period in Los Angeles, we had a doubling in the alpha and beta readings of radiation versus the last period. It's also reflected in the U.S. EPA's uh, radiation station somewhere in Los Angeles where they had a a pretty substantial beta spike in uh, a week in early July that kind of conforms to our higher radiation here. Now, you know, we know what we're doing. There might be some people new to the program, but since March 15th, 2011, we've taken over 2,374 radiation tests, so we have a pretty good idea of what's going on here in Los Angeles. What we what will be coming out in the big hot orange, we have new reports of high radiation in rains across America and Canada that we get into that the numbers are astonishing. We've got hot rains now, Jeff, in southern Brazil, really hot rains that indicate Fukushima fallout is in the southern hemisphere. Southern Brazil, huh? Wow. Southern Brazil. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We had high ambient air radiation in Australia uh, off of uh, uh, Brisbane uh, about half a year ago, and that was just ambient mm-hmm. air, but it was it was uh, uh, sea mist which we've discussed. Oh, yeah. uh, now we have, when people in L.A. think, well, it's not raining on us, 
We don't have 91 times background like St. Louis uh, in their reign, knowing full well that anything over three times background is uh, hazardous, according to the California Highway Patrol, and precipitate, so to speak, a uh, hazmat situation. 91 times in St. Louis. Fact is, there are other ways that we're exposed to this radiation that are not any longer speculation. We've had Fukushima radiation detected in almonds, dry prunes, uh, pistachios, uh, and oranges, and also in Florida grapefruit. We've been looking at mutations. And you've been just great putting up links for folks to see about the mutating. But you can see the, see the pictures. Look at the look at the butterflies. Look at the vegetables. Look at the fruit. Look at the flowers. Uh, this is no joke. These are major genetic mutations. The damage is is quite observable. Uh, scientists in Japan are studying these literally all day, every day that they're in session in their schools and universities and laboratories. They're trying to map this continuing explosion of genetic damage from the Fukushima radioactivity. All these isotopes are going all over Japan. Uh, We've talked about thyroids. We've talked about children in the Fukushima prefecture who are not growing at a normal rate anymore. They're they're smaller than they should be already. We've talked about uh, people with teeth falling out, nosebleeds, hair falling out. Uh, Yoshi Shimatsu has talked about people with burns on their skin, literally from handling... Uh, radioactive mussels uh, that you catch uh, and eat on the seashore. Uh, You talked about that last week when he was on the program. We've tracked it. What we're trying to do, and what Michael and Denise and others are trying to do, is track the fallout as it comes across the Pacific or through the Pacific, in the Pacific, turns into mist and evaporates, evaporates into the air and then falls as rain one way or the other. We're trying to find out how much is coming over here how much we should be concerned, and what we can do about it. That's the whole issue here. Now, everyone knows that bananas, for example, are radioactive. Potassium is radioactive. Other kinds of kidney beans are radioactive. There are other things that are as well. What we're trying to do is chart changes directly attributable and caused by the Fukushima disaster, the catastrophe. We've talked about the tuna fish, which are actually hatched, and grow up in the waters off eastern Japan, and then come across on the North Pacific Current, the Kuroshio Current, and they end up along the California coast. It'll be interesting to see what they read compared to last year's tuna in August, which were over there on the waters in March, April, May, June, and July, and then made the trip across. They can come across the ocean in just six days. So what we're going to do tonight is trying to get Michael, to share his research to let us know what has changed here. We're not trying to frighten everyone into not eating oranges, not eating bananas for that matter, pistachios or almonds, but we have a right to know what kinds of radioactive isotopes have been transported here and are now in the soil and in the produce and the crops and the trees and the the topsoil and the dairy and all the rest of it. Our government's not going to tell us, so it's up to brave people who want to stick their neck out, do the research, and publicize it. And Michael Collins is right at the head of the class. So go ahead, Michael, and let's find out what you know. Oh, boy. I appreciate that. I wish uh, we were not in these times, but we are in these times. And now we're starting to get uh, the signature fallout from Fukushima in our food supply. Uh, We have seen uh, high radiation uh, in almonds, dried prunes, There was a test by a group called Security Tokyo on dried prunes just last month, and uh, they found cesium-134 at 0.08 becquerels a gram and cesium-137 at 0.11 becquerels a gram. Sounds like a little. Well, it's not. That's a lot, and it shouldn't even be in California dried prunes. The reason we know for sure that this is uh, uh, contamination from Fukushima is because cesium-134 has a half-life of just a little over two years, about 2.06 years, meaning that for uh, the half-life of a radionuclide in general plays out pretty much completely after 10 times its half-life. So this stuff here, it'd, be, it'd have to be 
20, it, it, something would have had to have happened in the last 20 years uh, to precipitate this. And at a level like this, obviously, in the last, say, year and a half, this is Fukushima, the only source on the planet that could be cesium-134. That's in our dry prunes. Not a good thing. You know, California supplies 99% of the United States dried prunes and 60% of the world's supply. This is a huge crop. Not only thing we have found, we found it in oranges. Now, California is uh, second after Florida in production, but the highest in actual monetary amount. California uh, uh, generally produces navel and Valencia oranges. Right, for juice. Is- yeah, D- navel oranges for eating, Valencia's for juice.